Welcome to Brainfluence. I'm Roger Dooley. Today joining me is my virtual friend from the UK, Peter Ramsey. Peter is an entrepreneur and user experience expert. While still in college, he founded Movem, a software platform that dramatically simplified the process of reference checking for housing rentals. A couple of years ago, a big insurance company acquired Movem, and these days Peter is focused on his consultancy with the unusual name Built for Mars, where he helps large and small brands improve their user experience. Welcome to the show, Peter. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah. So, uh, Peter, I guess this is something that you answer answer constantly, but uh, let's let's start with the name of your company, Built for Mars, because uh, it actually sort of ties into the theme of what you do. Uh, ex- explain that. Yeah. So it was. Um, so I've I've been running like a as I say like a consultancy for a couple of years. Built for Mars is. I basically had to come up with a brand for it to be able to publish some stuff online. I didn't want it just to be my name. Um, and the concept of built for Mars was, was really that people build products in offices and they work on Macs and iPhones. But then when you take that out of the real world, you take that out of the office and put it in the real world, it, they sometimes break. And so the concept was products should be built to work on Mars as just like an alien environment, right? So if you can build something that also works on Mars, then hopefully it works in lots of other areas. Right, makes makes huge sense. And this is something that's been going on, I think, since uh, the early days of digital, where I remember when we all didn't have fast internet connections, you'd have these websites that looked great to their designers because uh, they had a, um, a broadband connection in their office, but uh, you put it on a dial-up connection for the typical home user and even many business users, and it didn't work at all. So, uh, but still, uh, you've got different different issues these days, but uh, the problem remains the same. And uh, also, you know, looking at different users of different skill levels, uh, you know, I think that probably an aspect you didn't mention too is, uh, could an alien use this if they didn't <laughs> yeah. have the base of knowledge that some users have? Because that's the other area where I think digital designers get trapped in. Things are obvious to them because they do this all the time. And if they ask the person at the next desk to test it, it's obvious to them too. But uh, when you, uh, you know, let your grandmother do it, uh, uh, well, it may not be quite as obvious and, and she may struggle. But yeah. in any case, uh, for starters, you know, I focus a lot on customer experience and user experience is, I guess, an element of that. How would you compare those two things or, uh, you know, is, is there a big difference? How, how would you define that? Yeah, so they're, they're pretty similar. Um, there's definitely like a gray area where they kind of merge. So I would define, I would throw user interface, so UI into there as well, just to help clarify this. So if you think about like um, a car, the UI would be uh, the materials you use and, um, you know, the, the, where the, the layout of uh, the wheel and things like that. The UX would be, can you at night fumble around and find the volume knob to like turn, right? Like through a tunnel. Can you do that with one hand without looking? Because that's like the experience. That's not how it looks. That's like the experience of using it. Now, the customer experience in that kind of example would be, you know, when you're purchasing the car, how does uh, the the sellers kind of make you feel? What do they, what kind of interactions do they have? So calling a call center, you know, I, I recently did a study on, on customer support. There is a user experience of getting customer support. And then there is like a customer experience in the sense of can they solve your problem, right? Um, so they, they definitely overlap, but I would say, the customer experience kind of transcends the user experience and it covers a lot more ground, basically. Great. And um, I want to get into your amazing banking study, but I will also for the moment, now our audio listeners won't be able to see this, but for our video viewers, I'm going to stand up and show that uh, I have my Friction Hunter shirt yep. on. Uh, <laughs> and Peter has one as Us. well. Uh, that is, as far as I know, the only one of those on your side of the Atlantic, Peter. Oh, wow. Uh, it's it's, it's nice. a really exclusive uh, shirt right now. Uh, but uh, the reason I sent Peter one of those, actually had it printed in the UK to, to speed things up a little bit, uh, uh, was because uh, he did such an amazing job of finding friction in banking uh, by doing something that no human should be forced to do and that is set up an account at 12 different banks. 
uh, and go through the entire process. Now, you know, I would think that if you were working in, uh, in a consultancy and somebody, your boss came in and said, okay, Peter, I want you to set up uh, accounts at all these 12 banks and in, you know, write it all up, look at every aspect of it. Uh, and you would say, oh my God, I don't, there's, that's not something that I want to do. It's horrible, but you actually forced yourself to do this. So yeah. uh, ex explain sort of the or origin of the study and how you, how you carried it out. Sure. So I, you know, I've been publishing UX content for, for about six months, which is taking a product like Disney Plus and then showing people where the friction in it is and where users would find problems and how they'd improve Disney Plus, right? Um, now, I've been doing those as isolated case studies, which, which you know, I, I think are pretty good. But I wanted to find a way to do something bigger. And, you know, to me, banking was in, was a sector where it's like, look, you work every day and then you take all your money and you put it in this thing, which is a bank, right? And, you know, largely. And that the experience of, of a banking app is something that is quite meaningful. You might use it every day. You'll probably use it for the rest of your life. It's got all of your savings in it. So for a bank app to crash, and there was actually a bank, Smile Bank in the UK that's been inaccessible for five days already oh, um, because of some error, right? So everyone with a Smile account couldn't access their money through the app. So it's like- yeah, The last thing you want to do is uh, go to your bank's website and uh, get uh, a 500 internal server error or something. It yeah, <laughs> doesn't give exactly. you a lot of confidence that your money is in good hands. Exactly. You're, you're not talking, a, you know, Disney Plus could get away with that and you'd go, oh, maybe I'll, you know, wait till tomorrow, but a bank can't. So, so for me, the idea of comparing these banks and saying, look, the banks should be the best experiences you can buy. That these are billion dollar companies. These are, you know, really like experienced companies. So they should be really good at this. And the idea of this was me showing that actually even these huge companies make really small mistakes, the kind of things that, you know, you would expect a very beginner design team to not make. Um, and the idea is that everybody makes mistakes. And so by showing it in banking, I can kind of compare it um, to other sectors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's funny how that works. A, a couple of years ago, I did a rare consulting uh, gig for a uh, very large financial company, not a bank, but uh, in the financial space. And um, my role was supposed to be to add some sort of behavioral science neuromarketing dust to their uh, experience to make them convert better. Uh, and when I got into what they were doing, it was much less a need for, uh, you know, non-conscious marketing and much more a need for just fixing what was really a pretty terrible user customer experience. Uh, just, uh, I mean, you would you'd have had a field day uh, writing that yeah. up. I mean, just <laughs> uh, seeing stuff uh, that, uh, you know, you would never see on uh, even a small company site, but I think that over years, these things just kind of uh, developed. You've got the compliance people, you've got the legal people. Oh, hey, you've got to do this. Uh, well, you've got to have these disclosures right up front. And, you know, so you see, just all, all those, these horrible aspects that made the site uh, very difficult to use, very difficult to figure out what you were supposed to do next, and certainly not effective at selling a product. You know, it, it mm -hmm. did not convey a sense of a warmth and comfort and, oh, yeah, I can, I can really trust these people. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> there's, you know, there's a, people refer to the term technical debt, right? Which is like, um, you know, these large institutions, typically banks, because so in the UK, um, there, there was a bank called Metro Bank, and they were the first bank in 150 years to get a banking license, which meant that all the other banks, and that was in 2010, all the other banks had had like decades to basically build stuff in, in languages that you would never build stuff in these days. And so if you look at the banking sector now, you know, the incumbent banks, they've got huge technical debt, which is every time they try and um, do something, they're like, okay, by changing that, we break something over there and we break something over there. And these challenger banks don't have that because they're quite fresh. So, so for them, moving is a lot faster. And, you know, the world of apps and, and the quality that people expect in applications has, has dramatically increased in the last decade, right? So like from web 1.0 to 2.0 to where we are now, um, the experience that people expect has gone up and 
you know, the languages and the debt and the weight of all of that legacy code is just holding these guys back. So I, I don't see it getting any better. I, I see actually it getting worse and eventually these banks will just start again, right? And in fact, if these banks aren't starting again already, I'd be surprised. Um, yeah, I've, I've seen that in airlines too. In, United Airlines is in a, when, when I was traveling, which I'm not these days, most people aren't, uh, used a lot and their website was uh, and still is pretty horrible. Uh, and it just hasn't improved over the years. They've put, you know, they've gussied up the appearance a little bit, but the, some of the functionality still uh, isn't changed. I'm guessing that's it's because there's a bazillion lines of COBOL there that they don't want to touch, that they're afraid to touch. But the app is actually quite good. I mean, they, they know how to create a good user experience, you know, it, but I think that uh, the app, they could start fresh uh, and uh, the website was tied into all this legacy stuff. But, uh, okay, you know, as you were looking at the bank experience, what kind of metrics did you look at? Like, what, what did you measure to uh, compare the various entities? Yeah. So I, I actually went into it measuring everything. So like hundreds of things. So what I produced was, or what I published were the most interesting five or six metrics for a particular chapter. So I split it over six chapters. Each chapter covered a, a certain thing that you would do. So opening an account, making a payment, um, international payments, that sort of thing. So I recorded everything, like literally counted the words on every screen, you know, everything you can imagine. And then, but, but the most interesting metrics that I published were things like how quick was the app? in terms of you know an infrastructure layer like how quickly the, did they load how quick are they to use um how much input was required so number of clicks and then i kind of benchmarked all of the banks against each other to say you know this bank was quicker than this bank and then underneath i i, I kind of went into the detail as to why it's quicker and why it feels better and sometimes why speed isn't the most important factor if it's quick but like dirty to use um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Which do you think, when you sort of look at the user experience overall, uh, where did you see the biggest differences between the brands? I mean, I'm sure some you looked at and said, well, okay, there's really not, uh, none of these really seem too significant. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, brand A is not that much better or worse than brand B, but I'm sure there are others where you said, wow, this, uh, you know, this really makes a difference and this bank is going to get more customers or lose more customers if, uh, you know, they, uh, because of this feature or the way it operates. Yeah. So international payments, I think was the, the largest, um, variance between banks. So, um, you know, it took, so the challenger banks, they were Revolut was free. Starling was about 70p and Monzo was about £1.30. Now, Monzo is a proxy because they use TransferWise. So um, what I did is I opened a TransferWise US account and then had a, like a proper account there. And then I sent money to myself from pounds to US dollars and then measured how much money effectively got through to the other end, right? Because that would cover all of the fees. And I actually paid all those fees and that sucked, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> but for some of those banks, um, so a few of them were, were nearly 30 pounds. So the difference between sending 100 pounds with a challenger bank to um, this account versus with an incumbent bank was about, you know, 29 pound 30. So it's like, why would anybody send money abroad using these banks when it costs you 30 pounds to send 100 pounds? And so for me, it's like, you know, that's a classic case of that's how much it used to cost, but because there was no transparency, because you didn't know what it cost, everyone just paid it. And now people know, right. And transferwise exists, a bunch of other, you know, borderless money transfer fintechs exist. So, um, yeah, there's certainly, yeah, and that, that. that really, you know, the friction that we talk about most of the time is uh, friction in the user experience, but, uh, in my book, I also talk about financial friction, you know, fees, taxes, uh, mm -hmm. all those things that get are part of a transaction that aren't ab absolutely necessary to complete the transaction. And uh, research shows and data shows over the years that when you have those extra costs added onto things, uh, they decrease 
that activity. Uh, and in this case, uh, that's going to decrease the activity for those banks that have the high fees and shift it to those banks that have lower fees. Yeah. And uh, um, let's. But it's uh, also. I, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, it's also, you know, the the way that the banks um, sell this feature, right? And effectively, the context they build around it making a payment online. So, um, you know, some of these banks there was a difference in markup and, and you know, the intra-bank FX rate they get and the one that they provide for the user, they will add like a markup on, right? And, and so that was anywhere from zero to 5%, you know? But they, they put that in the terms and conditions and they put that somewhere, right? And, and they say, oh, this is your exchange rate. It's 1.24 or whatever, right? 1.22. And it's only when you when you understand, like most people don't understand exchange rates. Like if you're just a general consumer and you've got no interest in stocks, no interest in markets, no interest in FX at all. And someone says, oh, the pound to USD right now is 1.22. You'll go, okay, if that's, if that's what it is, that's what I buy. Right. And, and it's the same model for air, like in airports where you try, where you convert money, right. It's, it's mm -hmm. how they make their money. So it's like, you know, it's not that the banks are just more expensive. It's that there's actually some complexity and terminology there that they're not doing a good job of explaining to the users. Well, it is challenging. I know when I travel, I tend to just use a credit card most of the time. Uh, one that hopefully does not charge me uh, fees for uh, currency exchange. But, you know, sometimes I do have to convert cash. And uh, it's really confusing because you'll see one place says no fees, you know, free transactions, but their exchange rate is bad. Yeah. Another place may have a higher fee, but a favorable exchange rate. And, you know, for the average person, just having to sort this out uh, is a real pain. And, uh, it, but where, where you've got a confusing thing, and particularly you go to one of these exchange places and they've got uh, 47 different currencies displayed and they're trying to figure out uh, which direction you're going in and it, it can be kind of confusing. And, you know, what does mm. that 0.87 really mean? Yeah, uh, but um, so, you know, you did this sort of massive teardown on the experience and different aspects of doing things, Peter. Uh, how would you uh, compare that activity with, say, uh, if you had access to this, which, of course, internally uh, they do, uh, say, measuring user behavior data, like, you know, where, how long are people spending here? What are they clicking on? What are they trying to click on? And, you know, all the wealth of data that you can get from any kind of digital app or website these days, mm. uh, you know, uh, how, which is more valuable or do you need both? Or how, how would you, uh, how do you, yeah. do, how do you structure that? Mm. It's, uh, it's tough. So I think companies rely on data too much. So, um, you know, this data exists, the companies will, I assume, be looking at it, but data doesn't tell you everything. So, you know, as I'm sure, you know, you've, you, you know, you, it's hard to measure friction when it's like anger or frustration. How do you measure yeah. frustration, right? If people, if people aren't clicking off and they're just carrying through, but they're annoyed and then they take that annoyance and then they tell their friend in the pub that they're annoyed at your app, right? How do you measure that? incredibly difficult right um, right there there are tools to do that actually uh facial oh, coding and okay uh, uh, even uh, there is profanity detection in call center uh, voice systems uh, they uh, you know it's it's, okay. it's, it's a sad uh, state when we have to measure whether people are cussing out our automated voice systems but, yeah uh, that's that's a thing okay so I, so i didn't know that so the on the automated like press one for there's they listen to that do they and then well they um apparently have the ability to listen and this i don't know how widely implemented this is but i have uh, been told by people who study these things that it is implemented in some call center situations where yeah. they they can uh, actually detect uh, um, uh, a profanity and also i guess uh, to the sort of online equivalent would be rage clicking when yeah, people so, are trying to get something done and they just keep clicking and, uh, nothing's happening yeah, yeah you can measure that too yeah so you know I, okay so there's, there's a few examples there but i think largely like like anger might be the easier one right like right. how do you measure loyalty right like there are a bunch of experience 
things and how people feel that are hard for data to, to capture. Mm -hmm. So, so for these, there's two problems with, with what, what, what you said, the, well, the question. So one of them is that it's hard to measure. And so when these banks have the data, they're not getting the full picture. So they need to use both the data they can see and also their common sense and uh, learning what users think, right? And, and however they get that data. The second is their data for stuff like how quickly do we pick up the phone might not include the time the user spent to trawl through the app, find the right number, sit through the dial, you know, press one for, press two for. Like the call might be picked up in 30 seconds, but they spent 15 minutes going round and round and round. So, you know, I'm, I'm skeptical as to, you know, when the banks measure this information and how, how they measure it. Um, for example, right. how, quick, how quickly their app loads, right? Like when do they measure that the app is loaded? Is it from the first time their server pushes the first image? In which case, is that a second delayed? Like, um, you know, I think, right. yeah. And, you know, it, I would say that any responsible business would use uh, tools that are readily available to see, say, how quickly your website loads where, you know, some remote site uh, tries to load it and do whatever you would normally do. Uh, so you're not uh, connected directly to your own server and such. Uh, right. But uh, I, I have a theory that many companies measure only those things uh, where the data will produce an answer that they want to hear. Uh, yep. I've, um, looking at customer experience, I had uh, a super frustrating experience with my internet provider, which uh, shocking, isn't it? I, I know that that never happens anywhere, but internet <laughs> providers tend, tend to be monopolies uh, in their particular area. Uh, and, uh, you know, at the end of this frustrating experience, I was really hot. And I was going to say, I, get, I never do those customer survey things, you know, the, where they say, uh, you know, stay on the line. And, yeah. well, uh, in this case, all they did was ask me about the agent I had spoken with. Like, was your agent helpful and courteous and so on? Uh, they didn't ask, you know, how was this overall experience? Uh, did, we did we solve your problem? Did, uh, you know, yeah. would you recommend us? They, they didn't do anything as simple as even a net promoter score uh, question uh, because <laughs> the answer would probably be very disappointing to their CEO <laughs> to find out yeah. that, uh, you know, nobody would recommend them to their neighbors. Yeah, but well, you've, you've touched on another thing there. So I, when I talk about the difference between large and smaller companies in, I sort of have this keynote presentation that I end up doing. Um, and, and there's three debts that I say these large companies have. The first one is technical debt. The second one is legislative debt. So, you know, is there some regulatory body holding back these organizations and not these ones, right? And then that does happen. And in banking, um, you have what's called the CMA and they, they hold back these larger banks to a greater standard than the newer mm -hmm. banks, right? The third one is political, right? I, I call it political debt. Now I could probably come up with a better word for that, but it's basically the middle managers of middle manager effect, which is kind of what you just described in that like someone is trying to get a promotion and they're in charge of the net promote score, right? So they are only showing that survey to people who have already passed a certain criteria. Because if they do well, you know, they get a raise, they get a promotion. And then their boss, even though they know that goes on, they don't care because if they get a good NPS, then they can show their boss. And you end up with this cascading like system that you know people aren't getting the right data and the people in charge of collecting the data are not the ones that like they're not the ones that should be collecting it basically you know asking a developer how quick is our website that you've designed right it's like well they'll find the best score they can right they'll they'll pick servers that will perform the best so yeah it's like the automobile dealer surveys which uh, historically at least in the US perhaps in the UK have been an important uh, metric for uh, dealer performance and if their ratings from their customers affect um uh, their bonuses from the car manufacturers. And so the traditional way of delivering a new car is to inform the customer that uh, in two or three days, you'll be getting a questionnaire. If for any reason you can't award us a 10, please call me personally and I will take care of that issue for you. Yeah. And so naturally, uh, most people, 
end up giving them 10s because most of the time probably nothing goes wrong anyway. And uh, they've been primed to give them a 10 as if anything less than a 10 would be uh, injurious to the, uh, this individual and his dealership. Uh, and also they've been given an avenue. If they have a problem, the way to get it solved is to call this person and say, hey, I got this survey, uh, but uh, my turn signal isn't working. Think you can get that taken care of. And yeah, we'll send out a truck and uh, tow your car in right away. <laughs> Mm. But, yeah, and, and you know the route to good user experience and good customer experience is is partly transparency, right? And uh, you know, for you know, I know Elon Musk is quite a polarizing figure, and but but one of the things that he undoubtedly does well is he you know through Twitter speaks to customers, right? Like you have the CEO of you know now thanks to the stock market the largest car company somehow in you know the US but the world and you know he speaks directly to people like idiots like me right he hasn't spoken to me but people like me that go hey i really want this in the car and he goes cool yeah we can do that and you know that kind of transparency and having that having that um you know that plane to to be able to put forward suggestions is how you know that bypasses the middle manager of middle manager kind of debt really mm -hmm. yeah you know one other way Peter, that companies can evaluate uh, their app or their website experience is to, or their call center, I guess, uh, is to do sort of a, either a lab type study where they bring people in, perhaps off the street, uh, uh, to use it while they're being observed uh, through a video or uh, two-way gla glasses or one-way glass and so on, uh, or perhaps using digital panels where now uh, you can hire these companies and say, hey, I've got a new website. And in a few hours, uh, they will have uh, 10 people or 50 people use your site and record their experience while they're doing it. I'm just curious what your opinion is on those as a way of uh, testing or measuring user experience. Yeah, um, I've used them. And my experience with them has been pretty poor. I think that, you know, I'm sure that there's a psychological term for this and I'll kick myself for not remembering it, but, but the, you know, the act of being monitored changes people, um, you know, how people think and how people use stuff. And the I, Western electric effect, uh, from that, an old and, and partially discredited, I guess, study, uh, in which uh, they were trying to measure the results of lighting on productivity. And what they found was when they turned the lights, uh, made the lights brighter, people got more productive. And then, well, hey, it worked. Then they turned the lights back to the, the other, the old setting, and people got more productive again. And <laughs> it turned All out right. that it made them aware they were being monitored. But uh, I think okay. the results of that have been called into question. It's been a long time since I looked at that. All right, nice. Yeah. So you know, but but I certainly, you know, anecdotally, I know that. So you know, and I think people are aware of that when they bring in customers to their office, and you know, hey, we really just want to learn about how you use our product. You don't get the real world experience. So. You know, there is software like, you know, tracking software that can be used to, to, to kind of watch users actually use a product without them knowing they've been monitored. Um, you know, I've used them in the past. I know people have used them, um, you know, as long as they're done in a, in a good way, I guess it's fine. And um, that can be better than because people don't know they're being watched. And then, you know, you can kind of get that experience. But mm -hmm. um, I think the world of you know, when I think about like films and stuff and they have like the panel where there's like five different flavors of Coke and they go in and they give their opinion behind a glass screen. I think in software, that's more difficult because people don't interact with apps with other people. They sit at home on their sofa on their own, right? Like in front of the telly using the app. And, and so when you take someone out of that context of casually scrolling and you put them in like a lab, it's like they don't think the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my critique on the uh, digital panels is that they are good for uh, fast feedback. If you've got something new and you want some uh, quick feedback on it, uh, then, hey, it's, it's better than not doing anything at all. But uh, to me, they're, uh, these panel members end up not being naive users uh, much of the time. You know, the first time they look at a website and they're told to, okay, figure out how to uh, buy a pair of socks on this website uh, and just talk us through it, then, okay, that's probably a legitimate experience because it, 
unless they're really uh, avid shoppers, they may struggle with it. But if you've done this a hundred times for different companies in different industries, you become almost a sort of mini UX expert, uh, not with the formal knowledge, yeah. but but you don't you've seen the buy button hidden in the upper right corner and lower left corner and every place else. So now you're pretty, pretty adept at finding the buy button, even if it's put someplace where the average user might say, oh, where, what am I supposed to do now? Yep. Uh, so, but I, but I, at the same time, you know, to me, a company that does anything uh, is <laughs> better than one that does nothing. And it, I really got the impression some of these companies uh, design something and just sort of push it out and say, wow, yep. Hey, it looks great. Yeah, no, I, I, I'd agree with you, actually. I think it's better than nothing. And, you know, as long as they understand that the, the, the people in these digital panels are self-selecting, right? It's not, it's not jury duty. They're not being called up by, you know, randomly. You know, you're picking people who make 50, you know, 50 cents an app or whatever, right? To, to click around stuff. And they may have done hundreds of these things. So exactly like you say, you know, they're used to navigating websites they're probably pretty technical they probably understand you know on like how to do the certain things because they get asked the same questions which is like sign up to my website what do you think about this what do you, you know there's probably only like 10 questions they ever get asked so um it's better than nothing though for sure mm -hmm. um, you know peter one area that i focused on uh, over the last few years uh, not in as formal a way as you do but uh, is site search in comparing uh, the effort to accomplish stuff on people's websites. And I've uh, looked at differences between like uh, big uh, sort of home improvement brands. And uh, I I'm curious whether you have gotten into site search at all and whether, um, you know, what, what your thoughts are on that. Yeah. So I've done, uh, you know, I've done some site search stuff within case studies. Um, I haven't done anything site search specific. Um, so I guess, I guess I don't have like a broad, uh, opinion on site search, but like everything else, I think some people do it poorly. Some people do it quite well. Um, as with most of UX, um, you know, the, the benefits and the wins are in the nuances and the niche kind of, uh, context building elements you add. So, um, shopping on Amazon is, is pretty easy because you can type something and you bet it's there, right? Like you don't think about like you could type anything, right? And it's pretty much there. But if you were shopping on some random, you know, website for like something really small, you might need a little bit more help. You might need, um, you know, mm -hmm. a few more examples. They, they, by the way, in my, uh, much less formal study than uh, what you do, uh, Amazon was the top performer. They uh, inevitably uh, gave you smart suggestions as soon as you began typing, and their their suggestions were closer to your end goal uh, than other brands. Some other brands, uh, Home Depot, did pretty well with that, with offering smart suggestions. And then also their results uh, were uh, typically 100% uh, spot on at least for the organic results. Uh, occasionally sponsored results end up just being poorly designed by the uh, advertiser. They match a keyword and don't exclude some other keywords. So if you're looking for, you know, a, a camera with a zoom lens and you've typed uh, digital camera zoom, they just saw digital camera and match that. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, it, uh, it ends up being, but, but by and large, uh, uh, they do a great job. The other area of, that I've seen that really drives me crazy is, you know, reviews are so important these days. And it used to be that Amazon was the only place that had a sufficient quantity of reviews uh, to really uh, make them usable. Other uh, uh, sites would have no reviews or 12 reviews for product where, you know, they're so skewed by the small number that you don't know if it's meaningful, but now other mm -hmm. sites are getting there. But searchability of reviews, you know, what I find I'm doing often is okay, I've got this product, I'm looking for uh, this feature, how you know, do people like this feature? And if you've got 500 reviews, and they're displayed uh, uh, five per page, and the only way to get through them is by going from, you know, page one to page two to page three, uh, it's really not too helpful. I mean, the overall rating is helpful, I think, but, uh, you know, it, uh, just adding that 
search feature, it will let you show all the reviews that mention the specific characteristic that you're looking for. Just mm -hmm. such a simple little change uh, that would be useful on so many sites, but uh, many sites don't have that for some reason. Yeah. Well, I mean, one of the, you know, one of the, the issues with reviews are that, you know, people psychologically in like are looking for negative reviews firstly, right? Like you, you can see 500 good reviews and then you see a bad review. So, you know, the searches are, um, you know, visually when you look through something you're finding the bad ones, skipping through the good ones. When the other, the, the other issue with it is that a lot of the time these reviews are hosted on third party websites for like credibility, right? So, so TripAdvisor is, you know, the platform where you can book and have reviews, but initially they were just like reviews and you would be booking somewhere else and that would be your credible source. So the hotel on their website, you know, they wouldn't have built a way to search and filter all your TripAdvisor right. reviews. That's kind of TripAdvisor's job, right? Um, and that's kind of what happens, you know, especially in the UK, you, you have a few kind of big names for reviews that um, do similar things. And yeah, I, I don't know what the solution is. I mean, I mean, Amazon has obviously the quantity on their own platform. And yeah, I mean, your example of features, if I was buying, yeah, a camera, I'd, I would want to type in, you know, like waterproof and see if anyone has dropped their camera, right? And, and did it survive and right, you know, exactly. all that sort yeah. of stuff. But yeah, that's, that's, poor, that's done quite poorly. Um, yeah. So Peter, you've looked at uh, different industries and uh, I'm curious as to whether you could, uh, a, a, you, banking is the one that you've looked at in great depth, but I'm curious whether just in either your more formal work or even just in uh, your daily life, uh, is banking uh, the worst typical user experience on average? Or uh, is, is there another industry that uh, makes banks look good? <laughs> um, I don't think they make banks look good, but so there's, so there's a few. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm actually doing more publications like the banking one um, on other sectors. So they take time. So it will be kind of Q3, Q4 of this year. Um, but one that I'm not doing, but I would like to do is car uh, information systems, right? So, um, you know, I use the example of a car for UX all the time, but actually, you know, if you ever get in like a, like a lower, even like a, actually even a high end car, like an Audi or BMW, you know, the screen on that is low resolution. You're, you're, you've got this like dial to try and like navigate through the letters. Um, you know, the back button is all the way up there. So you have to scroll for like a minute to get like all the way back. <laughs> you know, it's, if you took that screen and you said to a consumer, how much would you pay for this software and this experience and this screen? You know, they would go, well, this is the worst thing I've seen all year, all year, right? And then they, they take that and they put that in a in a sixty seventy thousand you know dollar car, and they're like, that's our that's our information screen. That's how you get your your maps on it. And you're like, Google Maps is thirty times better than what you're showing me, right? Like I'm just gonna, and that's why people have nice cars and then have a, a silly little like dongle for their phone to sit at, right? Like next to where right. the information system is. Cause they're, they've gone, it doesn't matter how good this thing is. I'm just gonna use my phone. Um, Maybe that's why Tesla is the most valuable right. auto company in the world. Right, so, so I, you know, I'm a big fan of Tesla. Um, I think that's exactly one of the areas where, you know, these other car companies just don't understand how far behind they are is that like, you know, Tesla have, what they've done is make great software as well, right? Like, the, the UI and the UX of, of a Tesla um, in isolation is, is pretty good. It's not, you know, it's not as good as Apple, it's not as good as Google, but like it's got all the right pieces and it's certainly not clunky, um, I don't think, but. Um, mm -hmm. Well, that should be an interesting project, maybe an expensive one if you've got to get all these cars, wow. but uh, I, yeah. I, think, I think you're the man to do it, Peter. Uh, I think we should uh, probably be respectful of your time and wrap up here. So uh, let me remind our audience that we are talking to Peter Ramsey of Built for Mars. And Peter, how can people find you and your work? Yep. So I the, the easiest way is just um, the website. So builtformars.co.uk. And there's a newsletter on there. Uh, it's totally free content. Um, 
so there's yeah if you enjoy this sort of ux teardown stuff then i i, I release things on there every every now and then so that's a pretty good way awesome well, Twitter. we will we will link there and to any other resources we spoke about on the show notes page at rogerdooley.com slash podcast uh, and Peter, thanks so much for being on the show. It's been a lot of fun to actually connect uh, for the first time, at least seeing each other, if not in person. And I hope that uh, one of these days, as we were discussing off air, we can uh, meet in your local for a pint. Lovely. Yeah. Pleasure.